Um, hello, good morning, and uh, welcome to African Scholars Initiative, ASI Canada, Fireside Chats with uh, our guests. My name is Professor Gideon Christian. I'm, the, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Calgary Faculty of Law, and also the president of um, ASI Canada. We have a very important guest in our fireside church today. And our guests today reflect the resilience, the struggle of the girl child, of the African child. She started off hawking commodities in her village in Southeastern Nigeria and grew up to become one of the top 100 most powerful women in Canada. Our fire, in our fireside chat today, our guest is going to take us through her struggle from her social, difficult social economic background to a very enviable position she occupies today in, the, in, in Canada. Her name is Professor Rita Oji. Rita Oji graduated from the universe, uh, Nambe Azikwe University in Nigeria with a first class degree in computer science in 2004. Thereafter, she proceeded to the Middle East Technical University in Turkey in 2007, where she obtained her MSc in informatics in 2009. In 2010, she was admitted to University of Saskatchewan in Canada for a PhD program in computer science. She completed her program in 2014 and briefly worked as a research fellow at Yale University in the United States. She proceeded there from there to a postdoctoral fellowship in McGill University in Canada from 2015 to 2016. In 2017, or rather 2016 rather, she was awarded the prestigious Bantin postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Waterloo. In 2017, she was appointed as an assistant professor in Dalhousie University here in Canada, where she currently works as an assistant associate professor and also as Canada Research Chair in Persuasive Technology. In recognition of her outstanding scholarly and scientific achievements, in 2020, Rita was appointed a fellow of the prestigious Royal Society of Canada. And just last month, Rita was recognized as one of the top 100 most powerful women in Canada. It is my pleasure to welcome to our presentation or our fire site charts today, Professor Rita Orji. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, uh, Christian. I'm happy to be part of this chat today. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Hopefully, we have a very nice time together. Thank you, Rita. And um, just a thought of me for some quick uh, housekeeping. Um, I know a lot of you will probably be having some questions for Rita. I'm actually going to kick off by asking her my own question, and I have a lot of them. But I also want to leave the floor open for the participants to ask their questions. So please, if you have any question you want to ask uh, Professor Oji in the course of this interaction, feel free to leave your questions uh, in the chat box. So I'm going to be asking those questions either during the course of my conversation with her or at the end of the presentation. So please, please feel free to leave your questions on the chat box. So Rita, back to you. Now, um, it's, I mean, it's um, indeed a great deal of pleasure to have you. Uh, I know we've been making this arrangement for a long time now, but because of your busy schedule, uh, we're very fortunate that you're able to make time to attend and we're very happy to have you here. I won't want to uh, spend much time, so I just want to quickly go straight to my questions because um, I have a lot of them and uh, my audience will be looking to get your response. So let us start first. Let's talk about your childhood growing up in Oweli Court in Southeast Nigeria. What was childhood life like? 
So thank you. Yeah, uh, before I uh, proceed to uh, answering that question, I want to say uh, thank you for still having me. I know we've been trying to get this time to meet for some months now, but due to things and uh, the busy schedule, I wasn't able to find a time to do that. I'm, I'm finally happy that I'm able to do it right now. And uh, yeah, so coming back to your question, what was growing up like? Uh, it's a... Uh, I mean, uh, a few days ago, I kind of posted on, on Twitter and said, uh, when I get so busy, life seems to overtake me. I feel like I go back to my childhood and some of the stupid and naughty things we did those days that don't have names. For example, I posted last time and said, hey, I remember going to weddings unattended just to have food to eat as a student, as an undergrad student. And I know that these are things that most of us here would resonate with, especially if you grew up with parents who are farmers and lived in the village. So yeah, I grew up in a Wally culture, a village in Enugu State, southeast part of Nigeria, into uh, in a family of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Okonkwo Oji, who actually were pigeon farmers. And uh, I mean, my growing up has it's still one of the fun moments of my life, irrespective of all the difficulties that we had. And one of the key things that stood out for me is that irrespective of the fact my, that my parents were peasant farmers and struggled in terms of uh, trying to meet up with demands and everything, they were really, really hardworking. And apart from being hardworking, they actually inculcated that love for education in us. My father and mother never had the opportunity to have any form of education, so they can neither read nor write. But I remember on many occasions where my father would say that among this his child, he's gonna have professors, he's gonna have doctors, he's gonna have lawyers and all these things. And at, at, at that young age, I didn't actually know what those things mean, but you know, I just know that I had to pass. I'm not really just pass. I need to pass very well. It's not like my parents will sit me down to teach me, but you already know they're going to ask you to see your results. They don't even know ABCD, so how do they actually know? What they know is that my dad knows when it is 100 and when it is less than 100. So if it is less than 100, it would be what happened? Why did you lose one out of 99 or kind of stuff like that? So that was what my growing up like. We, we did farming. Of course, if I tell you my parents were peasant farmers, you should know that I helped them in farming. Sometimes we actually have to go to farm before going to school, especially during the planting season. Either we are going to harvest something from the farm or to go and drop something for my mother and my father in the farm before going to school. And the farm at times is very kind of a, it's a very far place, maybe like one hour, one hour 30 minutes trek from the house. And then my school, where I did my primary school and secondary part of my secondary school is around that another one hour trek from my house. So we do all those things. But beside that, you know, looking at my parents working very, very hard, doing all that they can to meet up with our demands, both the demand of school and taking care of us. Of course, we can't fold our hands. So as I, become of age, eight years, 10 years, and growing up then, we begin to involve ourselves in different things, including hawking. I know I hawk different things, Gary, think about it, in different, different things, vegetables and stuff like that, both in the market and in the streets, to make ends meet. So it's often like we come back from school, either we go to farm or we go to, for those hawking or do other house chores. So it's actually more like routine. Saturdays are not the days to study. They're more like the days to go to farm and help your parents. So at the time, this um, now that I'm already here, I kind of sit back and say, so how did we actually pass? You know, it's not like there's a time for reading. I can't really remember telling myself, I'm gonna just sit down on a Saturday. That's what I'm doing is reading to pass exam or something like that. It never happened. So I, at times I just look back and say, how, well, how do we pass? How did we pass? But that was life, day-to-day -day life, right? But what is interesting about that growing up is that it's not, I remember I attended a community secondary school, community primary school. 
So apparently in that, when we were in secondary school, well, basically it's, oh, some people like me, when you see here community primary school, you should know the caliber of people that go there. Apparently we never actually had a, any qualified teacher. It's almost like uh, using youth corpus or people that are in secondary school, in a good secondary school coming to teachers. So that was how we survived. But I remember what we do most times was that during the break, we kind of meet together and be lamenting this and that and that, you know? But in as much as these things will happen, I remember me telling my friends and even my sisters very soon, I'm not part of these things you guys are saying. I'm not meant to be here and I'm not gonna be here. I remember I started talking about gonna be in Canada right from when I was in primary school. When my elder sister kind of uh, beat me or something like that, I would tell her things like, when I would be in Canada, you will call me and I will not pick. <laughs> so this is someone who hasn't even <laughs> struggled through from high school. I don't even know what school, but you know, that kind of, I had big dreams. Yeah, For yeah. me, I knew that this is just temporary. I never liked to go into farm. So today, when, when I like to, why I like telling this story is that at times when I'm talking to people, I have had someone tell me, do you know what it means to go to farm? You're there and you're just talking. You, you, know, you don't experience what it means to go to school. I just laugh. I say, I passed through all these things. Just think about it. I did them. Even while I was in the university, if I come back and there's a need to, I still go to farm. So that was what it is like. But you know what? When I, when I, I, I tell this story, I like bringing out the fact that I don't think that if I didn't pass through that kind of childhood, I would be where I am right now. Because, you know, I learned the value of hard work. When you talk about integrity of labor, I learned how to work honestly to earn a living. And above all, those childhood things actually taught me how to multitask and balance things. I tell you that I, I, I used to go to the farm in the morning and from there go to school and maybe come back from school if there's any need to go to the farm. We have assignments and the exam is coming. But I have to pass. This is not an excuse, right? Yeah. So right now, when people ask me, how do you do what you do? I don't even know how I do it, but I just know that I have th that skill I learned from my parents yeah. actually helped me right now. I'm not saying I'm a superhuman, but I just found out that I can easily navigate multiple things at a time yeah. and none of them will fall off. You know, Rita, I remember the, um, some time ago, I can't remember exactly when you when you tweeted about, you know, walking on the street and then also reading your book on the street. Exactly. So really I was coming to that. So at times when we do those hawking, apparently, you if you have an assignment and maybe you're going to hawk till night. I remember if this is a village. We don't have electricity. Maybe we have two lanterns and stuff like that. So apparently it's not like in the night I'm going to do my assignment. There might not be even uh, uh, stuff in the, in, in the lamp or whatever they use. We use them to, to put on the light. So when we are now having those, uh, if we have to sit down in a place to hawk what we're, as you mean, I have to sit down to sell the vegetables some, for some time before moving around. I have my books. I open it up. Wow. Either I'm reading it and figuring out the assignments. So things actually go on hand in hand, most times when I'm doing things. And there's no time like a reading, a reading time, a sleeping time and all these things. And I grew up that way, even right now. If I tell people that from my first year till none, I don't use the library. I'd never go to library. <laughs> and if you live with me, I remember my undergrad, people tend to ask, where do you read? I don't know. I just know that reading happens anyhow, any day, any time. You know, <laughs> I, really, I really do not need a specific time to read, a dedicated place to read. I can read anywhere. Those training happened to make me resilient in a way that even if a place is so noisy, I can do selective attention. I no, select what I pay attention to. It can be in a market, but I can read and understand. You know, Rita, if you're able to read in the market and on the streets and understand, then definitely you can read everywhere. Exactly, <laughs> that's what happens. I can read everywhere right now. I can work everywhere right now. And it's not something, it's not a skill I built today. It's yeah. just what I found that I'm not part yeah. of me. So going to the library makes me tense because everywhere becomes so quiet. Quiet. Right? Yeah. Too quiet for your liking. Too well, quiet for my life. Things become too serious for me to go, <laughs> right? Even here in my house, 
when I'm reading, is either the television is on. If if not that I'm talking to you, you'll probably hear very loud music. <laughs> that television is on, or the music is very loud, and yeah. I'm dancing to it, I'm singing to it, maybe <laughs> writing a paper or reading a proposal. You know, somehow the people I, li I live with might not be able to cope with that, but that's me. <laughs> so it's either I use my earpiece and stuff. But, so there's actually a benefit to some of those things that we pass through. Exactly. Sometimes, I mean, the skills I have right now, there's no time I could tell you that somebody uh, uh, taught me how to do it or something like that. But those difficulties we had to pass through as a mm -hmm. person actually prepared me for what I am right now. I do not see it. It also, what is important to, to highlight is that it also taught me how to look at things from the bright side of it. Yeah. I remember as a child, I would never tell you there's a time I liked farming. I never. Almost that I tend to cry almost going. Because it's not my thing. I didn't like it. But I have to. Your parents cannot be farmers so you're not doing it. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Right? But what is important for me then is that I see it as a temporary thing. Yeah. I knew that I'm not going to last there for a long time. I was just waiting for time to happen. And that was what my child is. That's nothing I didn't do. Apart from that, I was involved in dancing, music. Just think of anything, anything anybody can do. That's nothing I wasn't involved in. That's nothing I wasn't involved. You wouldn't even know that I go to school because you think that this one is not serious. I mean, it's still like that today. Most people look at me like this on serious one. Well, yeah, it's a two I yeah. Rita, let me ask you this question. I mean, at this point in time, I mean, as a kid with this socioeconomic difficulty, wake up, go to farm, from farm to school, come back from school, then go to hall, come back at late at night. At this point in time, and of course, you've said that you were dreaming about Canada, which very, which was very strange at that very early age in life, when you haven't I, even seen, when you haven't even seen commercial place like Lagos, you're already dreaming beyond the shores of Nigeria to Canada. At this point in time, do you have this ambition? Okay, one day I'm going to be a university professor. I'm going to be our, our, our top 100 women, most powerful women in Canada or in Nigeria. No. At what stage in your life did this dream start? Kind of, you kind of start thinking. Oh, this is a reality. You know, I, 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 I forgot a very important thing in my growing up as well that actually would contribute to this answer. You know, apart from my parents and the work ethics that they have and this uh, uh, way of letting us see beyond our immediate circumstances and believe in the value of work, we were really immersed into church. Okay. So... We go to uh, the other thing we do a lot is church. Most times it's morning mass. It's uh, I, 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 I'm a member of Catholic Charismatic Renewal, so I probably go to church four to three to four times in a week, or four to five times in a week. And the church is not like it's close to my place. Stay another one hour close. So, but what I now added to me starting to dream big and see that there's nothing impossible was actually. Um, The believing aspect of me, the God believing aspect of me helped me because being immersed into church, when I now become older to understand what I'm doing, I'm now start going to church as not what my parents want me to do, but what I now understand what I'm doing. I, I begin to see possibilities that are beyond my sphere. So I, I started having big dreams. I think the dream of becoming a professor came in at the point I was in my secondary school. I can't remember what event triggered that. But I can't remember having seen a professor myself in that village secondary school. But I began to think I'm going to be a professor, right? At that point, but I, I becoming uh, powerful and whatever that means, I didn't, I didn't dream about it. I just knew that I'm going to have a better life. And I know that better life is going to come from education. So somehow, somehow, I'm going to pay attention to education, irrespective of every other thing that is happening. I'm going to make sure that I pay attention to education because that is actually the ticket out of this poverty that nature has placed someone. So that was my belief. And then that God believing aspect of me made me know that there is nothing impossible. So I, 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 think, I think it made me kind of a bit radical in thinking. Most times I remember my secondary school when I said something to my classmates or my friends, they, they, they get shocked. It's like something is wrong with you. Like either they tell me that uh, that's that way they put it, like uh, building castle on the air. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. Things just come to my mind. I say it and laugh and leave them and start going. But 
you know, it's, it was that radical thinking as I'm saying it and speaking it out, then somehow, somehow within me, I, I'm geared up to work towards that. I just see things working, kind of putting themselves in a way to manifest that I have been saying somehow in a way that I didn't even know. It's not like I consciously said, hey, it has to be Canada or not. Mm -hmm. Though I had to make that decision at a time, but initially that wasn't the case. Yeah. Now let's proceed further. Uh, we just have so much here. So I'll kind of try to maximize the, the time we have by you know, asking as much question as I can show to you. So let's now transition to university education. Let's talk about university education in Nigeria. You came from a very, from a family with, from low, very low income family, peasant farmers, you know. At what point in time did you realize that university education in Nigeria was possible for you, notwithstanding the socioeconomic difficulty you were coming from? So, uh, yeah, after my secondary school, um, our year and stuff, I happened to do very well. And then uh, won some uh, uh, award, local award, on because of my performance. So I remember I didn't come back to receive the award. It was my father that received the award in the village. And when he received it, my dad is a hard man. Someone told me that he was almost shedding tears. Mm -hmm. And I laughed, I said, because of Wayek, that when, that when I'll be graduating from university, I have the best graduate student. You know, I, that's what I said. I yeah. will see what, what his reaction will be. So at that point, I wasn't sure what I was saying. But the thing is that at the point, uh, it was obvious that we are good in the family academically, but the finance wasn't there. But you know, God has a way of working things. I have an uncle, my uncle, Uncle Sylvester. Actually, it's a it's a it's a very very helpful and good man. He he saw through most of my education, especially those trying times. So, although before, when things kind of gets difficult for him. I knew at a point I was already, they already found me a place I'm going to be, uh, I don't know, around sales girl, working in a petrol station kind of thing uh, with my sister. But my uncle said, no, he wouldn't be alive and this would happen. Even if it entails selling all his clothes, like he would do it. He wouldn't allow this brain to waste. That was his words. Wow. And I remember some people also came together and helped when I gained admission to the university. How much is the school fees? Because the federal university is actually less than 2,000, uh, 2000 naira. Okay. I, I, yeah, not dollars, 2,000 naira. So, but that was what happened. That was when I knew that university is when my uncle said that. And then after I had won that award from getting a very good result, now people became interested in me, right? Everybody was now looking for me to go to the university. And people were like, how do we contribute? How, what would they take and all those kind of things. That was when I knew that university is gonna be possible for me. Yeah. And eventually, yeah, I got to the year one and- uh, And that is it. Everything, everything <laughs> became a story, yeah. You know, this is one thing I like about the African society, that communal effort. That communal effort is actually what kind of sustain that society. I mean, in your own case, ordinarily, um, considering the socioeconomic uh, background of your parents, they wouldn't have been able to send you to the university, but uncle, family members kind of started coming in and that communal effort actually contributed to getting you where you are today. Another thing I want to ask you is this, I mean, uh, please don't laugh at this. I recall either on your social media or in my conversation with you, um, you told me that the first time you saw a computer was when you got admitted to the university. And I'm kind of wondering, how did you develop interest in studying something you have never seen before? Okay, let me actually comment on that communal effort before coming to this question, because that's very important. I thought it's only my village. I mean, this is something I would comment that will contribute to as much as I have the capacity, because I remember my parents I know, were not educated, but they were so passionate about education. Mm -hmm. And my other sisters would tell me that when they were still very small, right? Whenever someone gets admission to the university, my parents would go and contribute. You know, the village will contribute mm -hmm. to support the person to go to the university. So my mom, after my dad and my mom has contributed, my mom would be saying, 
my own kids so that they will go to university. That, mm -hmm. that like, more like it's a prayer for her that God should hear her and, get, and help her so that her own kids will go to it. This is even before I was born. So that communal kind of love, I had people that were contributed for and they became a medical doctor. And they, so that village kind of a communal life really helped a lot. Yeah. Though it had already reduced to when I was born, just that my, I stood up in a way, but I remember before my, I was born, there were a lot of those happening, people that the villagers helped go to the university to even travel abroad. That was really, that's something in Africa that I really think it's exceptional. It should be encouraged for that. So coming back to your to your question, yes, I have never used a computer before I got admitted to study computer science. And the thing is, uh, the thing is, I am mathematically inclined. I'm a tech, I'm a technical person. Like growing up, it's not like the the way uh, people do that. This is girl and this is guys thing, you know. I played ball, I was a soccer captain. I mean, I do anything that tricks my fancy. And that's also, I would give that kudos to my parents. My parents, uh, although we're not a light in the north, but they kind of trained us. We are almost all equal girls and equal, five girls and four boys. They trained us equal in, I mean, when I mean equal, it means that there's no difference in what I can do and what my brothers can do. They didn't let us know the difference between a guy and a girl. For example, if my brother is here, my brother is younger than me, he wouldn't be here and I would be cooking. He would feel tense, like it's a disrespect on his own part. So he's going to do most of the job, ranging from cooking to cleaning and everything, because I am elder, not because I'm a girl or a boy. Yeah. And my parents trained us that way. Likewise, I cannot be here and my elder sister will be working and I will be seated. So we are trained to respect elders, irrespective of whether they are boiled. And they gave us that opportunity to explore our dreams without boundaries, without gender and age bounds. So I grew up in my house not knowing there's actually a difference between a, what a girl can do and what a guy can do. So I, I played around with guys in everything they do. So that actually breaking bicycle, trying to figure out what is in the radio and all these things. <laughs> So eventually, when I came back, when I came out to the wider world growing out, and I begin to realize that people actually treat girls differently from the way they treat guys. That was a big shocker for me, but somehow I had already developed in a way that I don't want that to, to, to get into me. So when it was time to get into the university, everybody was looking at me, I'm going to study medicine. But like I told you, I'm a technical person. I, I do well. I do well probably in all subjects. So, however, I knew that uh, things that are technical attract my attention more. Uh, I wanted it to a course that still involves some that technical aspect of mathematics. And I asked my other sister, what would that be? My other sister said that computer science would allow me to do that. My initial course I was thinking about was either chemical engineering or electrical uh, or mechanical engineering. These are the two courses I had. But somehow, somehow, somebody told me, if I study a mechanical, what will I be doing with it as a woman? I was like, that will not be able to use it. But that wasn't the, maybe that wasn't the exact thing that made me change my mind. When my sister told me that computing was going to allow me to use that uh, uh, mathematical skill. Beyond that too, I do not like a course that have so rigid rules, like do's and don'ts. I, I, I like something that I like you to play beyond the boundary experiment on things without like, you know, things A is A, B is B and all something like that. And computer somehow allows, you. I didn't know that it does that initially, but my sister knowing the kind of person I am and when I say which course would actually allow me to use mathematics, say computing, I went there and without using computer, without having used computer, I got into computer science. And you can imagine, it's not like it was easy. You don't think, of, I don't even want to tell you how stupid I was the first the first few months and the first uh, semester, it was insane. It was insane. But yeah, that's a story for probably the next stage. Uh, you know, Rita, what you just said kind of reminded me of um, a news article I read in BBC some time ago about um, a teacher teaching computer science to a school in Ghana. Yeah. He basically had to draw the computer on the screen to use a drawn computer to teach the student about computers. So they didn't really have that luxury of having a computer in the class, which is a huge 
much luxury in these parts of the world. I mean, kids as much as kindergarten are already exposed to that. Yeah, yeah. So now let's, of course, let, of course, I need to add here for the sake of time that you eventually ended up, you never saw computer before you went to study computer. You not only study computer, but actually became the best graduating student. In yeah, it wasn't easy. I mean, yeah. I probably should touch on that so that people know that it wasn't, I mean, everything, you don't have to see the end from the very beginning and everything. At times you have to move by faith. You know, I remember getting into the uh, faculty, uh, the Department of Computer Science. And uh, one thing is that I looked at the board and I saw a few names on the board. It's like in a very, very strategic place. I was like, who are, who are these people? These are the best graduate tests to them, people that graduated with first class. I told the person I'm with, my name will be there. That's how, that, that is how, uh, uh, the, the audacity of my dream. Somebody that I've never used computer, just coming from one little village with only two clots, is just speaking recklessly. She looked at me, I said, you and your mouth. I said, yes, let's continue. <laughs> so the thing is when I even in that year one, when I got to year one, remember coming from that, my little village, do I even, you see people that came from a very big school, can speak good grammar, knows how to use computer. Everybody was just showing off what they've got. Mm -hmm. Me, I don't have anything. I, I, I came with my low cut, my big skirt and nothing, nothing. It's what I was just there for is that it's like, am I part of this class? And the worst is when they started even teaching in the class, I saw that I was nothing. I don't even understand what they're saying. That is even the worst. I remember having uh, my first exam in computer because computer is something that if you had, don't have background, it, look, it doesn't look close to anything you know already. Mm -hmm. My first exam, when they were talking about uh, the gates, uh, the, uh, some of these initial programming concepts was really, really so strange. I didn't know what was happening. I almost started crying in the exam. I cry a lot. I was like, I can't be this stupid. How am I going to pass this through university? You know? And I remember one guy, when the, when the result came out, I can't remember what I got, but I knew I didn't get something good. So the report was getting 80 something, 90 something. I was like, gee, I was supposed to be in the same class with this guy. I just looked at the people that scored well. So I now had to, I followed you and said, please, can you explain to me what happened? How did you do it? And then what was important for me is I do not I do not care about who knows it, whether a teacher, whether student, whether young, whether old, I don't care. What I know is that anybody I have on the way that is able to teach me anything about this, I'm gonna listen to the person. And that's how I started learning. Anybody, mm -hmm. please could you uh, explain this to me? And I do my, I, I I remember sometimes because I was very small. I sit on the board with the teacher because there's no seat, right? Most of us stand up for the whole time, even not even seeing what the teacher is saying. So instead of standing outside and not seeing the teacher, I sit on the very podium with the teacher. The chalk or whatever will be pouring on me, do I care? It's not like I am wearing a very nice coat with my hair cut and the low cut and everything. So everybody tends to know me, but I do not care. What was important was to understand it. I follow the teacher, I follow my fellow classmates, explain to me, all this and that and that. And this, that is how the whole thing began. Wow. Surprisingly, by the end of the first semester, I had improved drastically. That I probably think the first semester should probably be around, uh, the, probably from the first, I should be around the number fifth in the class. I was like, eh, how did it happen? That was when I knew that I'm going to flip the coin. So from there, I took over and maintained it until the end of the the end of the study and lo and behold, I am here today. So most times it's not actually what you are right now. It's how, how far you, you want to fight, right? Yeah. Most yeah. times the people that win are, the, are not the people that merit it the most. It is the people yeah. that desired it the most. Exactly. I absolutely agree with you, Rita. Now let's... Um... And then let me put one thing and then I, I, I leave it there. You know, interestingly for me, remember how the financial struggle has been going. The moment I finished my year one, I was already above, uh, uh, close to or uh, above first class average in my year one. Then the scholarship came. I get it. I got a scholarship that saw me through the university. So I only had to care about scripts and all those things wow. in my first year. So that was really uh, the summary of that story. Wow, that's interesting, Rita. Now let's um, let's leave. Okay, you've graduated from Nigeria now. Of course, the next step is, I recall, 
Canada was one of the plan even before you got to the university. So after graduating from Nigeria, what was the next plan? So uh, I tend to tell people most times that your friends determine how far you can go and the information you have. I remember almost everything I have tried in life, the awards, the universities, the dream got ignited somehow by the people I meet or information I saw somewhere. The dream about going to the university abroad actually came one, it, it, there are two things that, that, that made it happen. When this scholarship I told you came out, my name became popular that, you know, they posted the GP. Now people be, knew that I am, I am, I, I, that I'm very smart. Yeah. So through that, I got some offers to teach. So I was teaching as a student, but in, in a kind of extra, extra lesson center where I was really paid big money, very big money, I can tell you. So apart from that, I also teach within the university, other students sometimes and get paid. Sometimes I teach for free. But what is important there, I teach in the chaplaincy uh, uh, within the charismatic, I was the academic coordinator. So I teach other students. But as those things were happening, I wasn't necessarily doing all of them for money. Most of them, I do not take money. But my name became very popular. People got to know about me. One thing that happened from there is that one professor that was a visiting professor here in, U in US, when he saw my name and my result, he said, you should leave this country immediately you graduate. So he took my results, got me my first admission for master's and PhD when I was in my third year in the university. I already have admission for master's and PhD here in New York, US here. So I was actually waiting just to graduate. The second thing is that actually ignited that vision is that I saw someone, a friend, the brother from UK came and visited her and I was asking the guy, so how did you get to UK? Who gave you the money? Told me you got a scholarship. And that's how it, so I said, is it possible? You, you graduated from here, he said yes. That was in my second year, I marked it. I'm going to get a scholarship to leave this country before I finish my undergrad. So for my third year, I started applying. And apart from this one I have in New York, I have other ones. So most of the time, I, 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 the, if I have any change I have in me, I remember I told you, I have probably like four, three to four cloth, pairs of cloth and shoes. And uh, I don't plait my hair. So there are little things that take my money. So any change I have, I just use it to go all night browsing. I didn't have a phone, neither do I have internet. You remember what they do call all night browsing those days? Like you go to internet yeah. cafe. Overnight browsing. Go. Yeah, when I go there, I was trying to figure out how do they do scholarship applications and admissions. Nobody was there to guide me. So I'll be just searching randomly. I'll be writing professors, applying for different, different things. I didn't even know how I was doing, what I was doing, but I was just trying to, like, when, before I'm done from this school, I should be leaving this country. So that was when all those dreams, from that person I saw and the professor that told me you should leave this country the moment you're you're done from undergrad. Those things ignited that dream. Mm -hmm. And then even when I went for visa for that, uh, to come to this New York for master's and PhD, and it didn't work because it denied me a visa. I went for, I wasn't supposed, I wasn't thinking I was going to stay a, a one day extra in Nigeria, but I did. But that didn't stop. I started applying for many other ones. If you look at my tweet the other day, I got even Oxford and everything. But th that dream came from meeting the right people. Yeah. that speak the right mindset to you. You, you know, most times the information you have determines how far you can go. If you meet with only people that tells you how to spend your money, how to wear the latest clothes and, and all these things, drive the latest car and all the, I'm, I'm not saying they're bad. I'm also so fascinated by those good things. And if, <laughs> now that I can basically afford them, I can't really spend my money doing it. But placing your priorities right is also very important. Exactly. Yeah. Being in the right network of people that ignite the right mindset of what you should be doing at a time is very important. Yeah. So Rita, um, we, I mean, in ASI Canada, I mean, we, we, we want to kind of narrow down now to the Canadian journey uh, because our objective as a, a charity, non-profit charity is to continue to attract the brightest of the bright like you to Canada. So let's talk about your journey to Canada. 
how, how did that how did that start? Oh, you already as a child had the dream, but now you've graduated. Um, Really, those things started uh, uh, when I was in my youth service. My youth service was used to do two things. One is to, because after I have denied, I've been denied U US visas, I already kind of felt a bit beaten up. So I'm already thinking if this traveling immediately doesn't work, I shouldn't be stranded. So during my youth service, I was doing two things. I finished almost either six or seven GMAT series. Uh, GMAT and the GRE are this kind of exams you take when you're doing interviews and stuff like that. Because I don't want to be told stories that after my uh, you, you, you service, I don't have a job. So I was getting ready for any aptitude test, for any interview. If I'm going to be called, I'm going to pass it. That was me. And during that time too, I did massive applications. I was lucky to work with MTN. And in that place, I have my own computer and also happen to have internet. So that was God's first miracle for me. So I used that time to plan myself. I massively applied for admissions other places, including Canada here. And I got Canada as well as other places to do my master's and to do my master's on scholarship. So that was how my journey to Canada started. However, at that same time, I also have admissions and scholarship in other places. I also went for visa to come to Canada. Somehow, let's, somehow. Let's, let's talk about that um, application. What, what was the result? So uh, yeah, I got, I, got, I got admission for master's in Canada with scholarship, but then I applied for visa and I was denied visa. What was the reason given for the denial? I can't exactly remember the reason is either one of those there isn't they don't uh, look at you favorably uh, uh, whatever that whatever that means uh, they are not convinced and stuff like that so but the 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 truth is that i was denied visa despite the scholarship and that was a very very big one for me so you had a full scholarship i do have a full scholarship and uh, still the visa application was and the scholarship uh, is not from abroad it is from canada it's from Canada, so and the yeah. visa application was there. And of course, the normal reason usually given is because they don't believe that you're a genuine, um, genuine student. And uh, I mean, this is one area in ASI Canada we've been very concerned because um, the statistics from uh, immigration and immigration and refugee immigration refugee and citizenship Canada with regards to visa approval or study permit approval for applicants from Africa has been alarmingly concerning. I think the recent statistics we got, which was for January 1 to May 31, 2020, shows that uh, the approval rate for visa applications, Nigeria, of course, is one of the top 10 study permit application uh, um, countries for Canada. It's among the top 10. But among those top 10, Nigeria has the lowest approval rate. And the approval rate within this period in question was 12%. That means for every 100 study permit application within that period, about 12 was approved and 88 was refused, you know? And this is concern of compare this with other countries like Korea. Korea had like about 95% approval rate, while Nigeria on the other part has like 12%, you know? And this is concerning because uh, sometimes you cannot begin to wonder why that is the case. There was a recent report that was funded by Immigration, Citizenship and Refugee Canada where the report actually finds out elements of racism within the organization, which is also tied to visa application process. You know, in fact, that report made reference to countries in Africa being referred to as the Dirty 30, which is very concerning. I mean, the Americans are referred to us as a shithole or whatever. I'm sorry for my use of that language. And then to the Canadians, we are like the Dirty 30s. So uh, it's good to have people like you who have actually gone through that process and who continue to show that even among these few that are allowed in, you know, to continue to exhibit that resilience, that skill, so that success, that excellence. And uh, we are hoping at least, you know, uh, the new immigration minister will probably look into this and review the study permit approval rate for most countries in Africa. It's really alarming. 
But in your own case, you were refused. And when you were refused, you headed to some other country that think you are a genuine student. And I believe that was what took you to Turkey for your MSc. Yeah. And Basically. completing your MSc, you haven't given up on us in Canada. You still decided to come back. So tell us about the second journey or the second yeah. attempt to come to Canada. So basically, like anybody else, being denied visa despite the full scholarship from Canada was a bit, uh, a hard not, was a very hard not to crack. But uh, as a fighter that I am, it wasn't going to uh, come on the way of my, my journey and uh, my, my dream. So I went to the alternative and uh, got there, did what I have to do fast and uh, before, while I was still doing that MSc there, I applied for another, I applied for PhD in Canada, and I was again offered multiple scholarship and admissions. And not only to Canada, I applied also across the country, United States, Europe, and everything. And I was offered a full admission, PhD, and scholarships. So when it was time to uh, decide on where to come, to, of course, Canada, after much, much, I said I'm going to come to Canada still. So this time around, I is submitted again, provided the proof of fund and whatever. And surprisingly, this came second time for my PhD, the visa came in, in less than two weeks. So it wasn't actually a, a lot of a trouble getting that. And that's from actually, Turkey, you were applying from Turkey. Yes, okay. I came from Turkey. And then I was, that's where I did my master's. So apparently, but that's not to say that the challenge yeah. I had as a person, as a student, some, um, uh, that, that was uh, probably seven or so years ago. So, no, 10 years ago, it's um, actually taken out from the system. No, right now I'm recruiting students. I have a lot of Africans working with me and most of them, or some of them, struggle through the visa process as well. Yeah, that's a number, been... them, a number of them have been denied visas. Th and that, you know, that... as, a, as a prof, it's very, very frustrating because I plan my, my term based on the number of students that will be joining me and the project I have at hand they are going to be working on. So it's a bit difficult to, to bet on international students these days because if you have a project with a timeline and the person you're hoping to bring to work on that project is an international student that have to seek study visa, yeah. you can't actually put your hope a lot on them if the project has a strict timeline because yeah. they might not be granted visa. Yeah. You know, I, I, I can relate to what you, I can re relate to what you're saying even in my own part uh, because uh, it's one thing as a, I mean, as a professor uh, part of your work includes supervising undergraduate students, you know, and you apply for grants. One of the conditions you have to fulfill in grant ap application is to show that you're going to hire undergrad students. And for some of us who are probably working, if you're working in a project that is related to a particular geographical location like Africa, where you have to, where you will need students from that location to work with, it becomes problematic for you to even be able to satisfy your grant condition of recruiting students when you recruit these students and then they can't get into Canada because of the immigration system that has been kind of either deliberately or unintentionally designed against them. I, was, I must confess I was fortunate I didn't have to go through that difficulty because when I applied for my study permit, I didn't apply from Nigeria. I applied from New York because I was in the US then. And the experience was seamless. It was, I mean, a seamless experience. But unfortunately, that is not the experience for most people I know. And it hasn't gotten better. It's continued to get worse. So we are hoping, of course, um, those who are responsible for designing this system and making change actually take this into consideration because it is a very unfair treatment for people from that particular geographical location. Now, and um, of course, uh, you were a product of a community. You know, you've talked about the community effort that got you to where you are today at that initial stage, you know. Now, let's talk about you now. In what way have you been giving back to the community you, were benef you benefited from, you know, that community effort? And why I'm asking this is because um, Canada, of course, is a choice destination for graduate education for bright and emerging scholars of African descent. You know, and this 
prospective scholars or graduate students do face a great deal of hurdle in realizing their dream to pursue graduate education in Canada from admission struggle, securing supervisors, and even funding. Uh, you have supervised some students, some graduate, postgrad, visiting scholars. I mean, for the purpose of graduate admission, what advice will you give to prospective students? And there are a lot of them here today, you know, uh, attending this webinar. What advice will you give to these prospective uh, students? In terms of you know graduate grad admission, contacting prospective supervisors, which is often prerequisite for admission to graduate study and funding. How have you been giving back to the community in this area? So for me, I, I would say that I'm one of the luckiest people in the world. Uh, apart from those initial time, I would say that I did all my studies on scholarship, traveled the world, someone paying for that, and I'm so I feel for, I feel so fortunate. And uh, because it's a personal passion for me to give back, to show people how to do it. I did not intend that everybody coming after me would have to pass through the same struggle I passed through. Mm -hmm. So I've tried to give back in many ways and I, talk, I continue to do that. For example, I have a known charity or uh, a, a, a charity organization, an NGO that I call the Education for Women and the Less Privileged, founded by me some uh, decades ago. To so actually, one of the objective is to empower people, help people, the less privileged one, especially women, to realize their dreams in the area of education and, and pursue a career and be independent. Apart from that too, I mean, being a professor, I, I would say that I have reasonable power to mentor, recruit, and direct people. As a student, I, I won hundreds of scholarships. I wouldn't say amount of money involved to, for some reasons, but I was, so I have learned a lot, both on how to do things, doing it as a student. I'm right now sitting on the other side of the table, what is looked at by professors when they are judging for scholarship, when they are looking at who to recruit. And because of that, people that know me know that I have a very heavy social media presence where I post tips, direct people on how to apply for admissions, how to get things, apply for scholarships. I opened a blog on that, that calls scholarship and admission tips. And recently I have launched a YouTube channel where I dedicate to answer questions and provide directions on what you can do to win scholarships, to get admission, to get professors and get them to uh, hire you, how to bridge your various limitations that we have. You know, I, 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 I just, like I said, I feel myself privileged because I've had this massive opportunity and massive exposure coming from where I'm coming from and getting to where I am. I've learned things that you cannot read in the books and I, I look for opportunity to give back. back. So it's, it's, it, I've just been giving back in a lot of ways as time and resources permit. Uh, I can't imagine uh, how many people, or uh, I was counting to last year, I have over 2,000 2, people who contacted, I'm thinking of those that reached me that said, we got the admission based on your direct direction and scholarship based on your, using your tips and everything. I stopped counting the moment we got to 2021. And it gives me joy, not because I know them or that I'm going to benefit because yeah. I feel I feel kind of a, a, a lot of joy when I see people progressing and fulfilling their dreams. Yeah. And that is why I am here to say, hey, there are things that used to be a black box. Nobody knows how it is done. But today they are no longer black box because we are there. We know how it is done. And we're gonna, we're gonna deconstruct it and see people see how it is done. I said, when I get to the table, I'm gonna make it as plain as possible so that a simple person will understand the process. And that is what I'm doing. So it's, 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 it's actually a passion to help to empower young people, to show them how to do it. Because what people lack is that information, how to do it. And in the absence of information, people perish. So that is the area I am concentrating a lot. Okay, Rita. Um, I don't know how convenient this will be, but if you could share those um, social media links. Yeah, I will share my, my YouTube link in a minute right now. Okay, if you follow me, and then I would also share that scholarship tips 
I come up there because I feel I don't have enough time to be answering individual questions. So when I come up there, I pick the questions that are asked. The one so, I posted last time, get... people, people have told me a lot how, how informative it is. And they're still there. You can follow me here. I'm just sharing the link right now. This is the YouTube channel. Okay. I don't know whether it is going in. Um... Okay. okay. Yeah. I think okay. it's um, yeah the YouTube channel is Diana. So please feel free to follow uh, Professor RG on her YouTube channel and um, get some more detail or insight into her um, various ways she's giving back to the community as well as tips you know for funding, admission, and others. Now let me quickly take one of the question. I have one question here from. Uh, uh, this is uh, Steven Sobulo. I think, Rita, this is for you. So he said, hi, Prof. I'm considering PhD in cyber psychology or something in this area. Can you supervise me? And can I assess a scholarship? Uh, I just finished my master's in science IT security in UK, and I have another master's in managerial psychology. Okay. Email. Okay, yeah. before I take that question, I just posted a link as well to the scholarship and admission tip blog. If you want, you can follow it and check it out too. That has helped a lot of people. And uh, this question that I got right now, I think my th this video I made on YouTube would actually help answer that question. Uh, cyber security, unfortunately, is not my area and uh, I'm unable to supervise you, but there are tips to getting supervisors. One is, let me just say to everyone here, especially if you're doing your master's in places like Europe and UK. Sorry, I also did my school in Europe. The emphasis is not on research. The emphasis is on passing coursework. Unfortunately, if you're looking at doing PhD, you want to start caring about research right from as early as possible. I, I, I am not employing anybody for, uh, to come to uh, do PhD to pass courses. At that level, I already know you're intelligent. You'll be able to pass your course. I'm looking at your research potentials. And this is exemplified by your publication, the quality of your publications. So the person that is, if you know you're going to be looking at PhD when you're doing your master's, even undergrad, begin to think about getting some publication, getting some research experience. These are things that people will look at. I've hired a lot of people in 2-1 over people in first class because of research capabilities. I tweeted a few days ago, I admitted the young man that had first class that have been years without jobs into my lab to do intern. In a space of three, three months, she, he got four jobs. It's not, it's not magic. It is principle. It is learning how to do it. It's learning what is important. It's learning what is important in your portfolio. So you might have probably three masters and you're still not employable as a PhD student because you might just do all three masters. All, all of them are taught masters, no, no research skill, no publication to show. Don't look for a PhD student with, where you going to start teaching how to do publications. So that is actually the, the thing there that you probably want to look at. The moment you have all these tips and look at the professors in that area, which I mean, in a day, I get probably 50 to 100 emails of potential students that want to work with. Okay. I don't take more than five on a year. I think I like something that I saw because telling people how to is very important than everything. When you see all these achievements I had, it's not like I woke up and just did it and it works. No, I had to face some challenges sometimes. But what is unique about me is that I plan. I plan. If I tell you, remember I told you the guy I saw in my second year. After seeing him, I said, by my third year, I'm going to start applying for admission. The moment I said that, I knew two things. I have to hold my GP at a very high one. I have to keep it. Secondly, I have to start looking for how to do the admission because I don't even know. So if you are planning to go to get admission the next year, what are you doing now? Are you waiting for next year? 
What are the requirements? For me, what I want to do in the next five years is already in my mind. I'm already looking at the requirements and ticking it off right now. By that five years, when I would do it, it will look like it just happened. No, I already started planning it. So that planning takes time. It also applies to getting admission and scholarships. The what I see in people is that impromptu, unplanned things, executing it and failing as many times as possible without learning anything to, about, from it. Fail, failure is not bad, but if you're not learning anything from that, it is bad. That's a way you will plan. But if, if like I was in Turkey, I know I was going to come back to Canada for my master, for my PhD. I started applying in my, in my, during my first year of master's, putting all the things I'm going to need together. And it was once. I got admission everywhere I applied with scholarship because it wasn't by it wasn't by luck it wasn't by wake up and do it I planned it yeah so that is what a lot of people lack that planning what do you need and you know what this guy admitted he's gonna get admission in many places right now but some people too because of the inclination many people have that everything has to come with money no sometimes you need to sacrifice for yeah. bigger gain. Even if it means volunteering to get the experience you need for research, please do it. It's better to suffer. I prefer to suffer for a period of time than to live an average life for the rest of my life. Yeah. That is my philosophy. So know what you're going to be going for the next time and then plan and get what you need to get there. If it means volunteering with research, it means, it means partnering with people, do it. Such that by the time it is time to do that application, you are ready. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rita. That's, um, that's, uh, that's very insightful uh, admonition. Planning is very important. Planning is very important. So don't just wake up one morning and then just start sending out uh, emails, uh, junk emails to every professor you find on, uh, on the internet. Plan things, know where you want to head to, you know, and then watch those plans kind of unfold. Now, another important, we have another question here. Uh, this question, of course, uh, is from Al-Bashir Mohammed. And, uh, sorry, Al-Bashir Al Mohammed. Uh, his question is, uh, good day, Prof. I would like to ask uh, Rita how she decided on Middle East Technical University despite all other graduate schools. So why Middle East Technical University and not the other ones? Okay. The, the, the thing is that Middle East Technical University, uh, if you actually check it, it's a very, very high, highly ranked university, but that is not actually how I decided. That admission came all packaged with a very good package in terms of scholarship and stress-free. You know, I didn't have to go to embassy to get visa. A lot of things came just pre-packaged. I just had to get into ready bought flight ticket and go. Wow. So after the much visa stress and everything, I didn't want to, I mean, I, I think it's uh, at times it said that destiny played out. I think that that was actually the the way it's supposed to play out. Because going to that school, I will tell you, changed a lot of things about me. Was the beginning of a bigger things for me. Yeah. Really, and uh, and uh, to be honest with you, I learned a lot. Uh, at times, I I it's not like I I I I, I rejoice over rejection. But also, it's also good to see the bigger picture eventually. When I look back right now, all those rejections, I kind of say, it's, it, it's good they happened. You know, someone will say, what do I mean? Because when I say it's good they happened, I actually meant it. I'm now seeing a reason. There was a journey that I'm supposed to pass through to get to where I am right now, to prepare me for what I am right now, for the big things that would happen. And I think one of those journey was going to Middle East because actually I will tell you that passing through the school was one of the toughest things that have happened to me. It was very tough. It was very tough for me, but yeah, it also prepared me. So I'm happy I did, but the major reason I chose that is that everything came prepackaged. I didn't stress about anything at all. Thank you, Rita. I have another question here from Nafisart. And Nafisart says, um, what does it take to be a mentee of yours? Yeah, it doesn't actually take anything. The only thing is uh, that my capacity is what limits the number of people I take at a time, right? Uh, uh, for the past month, I have stopped uh, taking new people until I, uh, the people I have actually moves forward, but it doesn't, 
it doesn't take anything. I just uh, want to take as many people I think I can handle considering my own commitment, work commitment. So I, I supervise a lot of students, a lot of PhD and master students. So giving them adequate time and also taking additional mentee, uh, I have to uh, take up to the number that I can maintain actually. Yeah, that, of course that's very important because I mean, you run a lab, you are uh, a research chair, you are a professor, there are many academic works you have to do. I think that's one of the bigger aspects of our work, trying to balance various, um, you know, um, uh, various activities, uh, as well as academic engagement. But when it comes to um, mentee, I think another important thing, and this is for the participants to look at, when you're looking for a mentee, don't just look at people because, um, oh, this person is popular, I want them to be my mentee. Look for people that are kind of, who are more like in area related to people who are heading towards the same direction you want to head to. You know, sometimes I get mail, I mean, I get email from people who are into engineering who want me to mentor them. And I was like, what do I know about engineering that I'm going to mentor you? I mean, all my life, it has been, all my academic pursuit has been about law. So sometimes it's also better depending on what kind of mentor, mentor sorry, you're looking at, to kind of narrow your search, not just sending emails. I do receive a lot of those emails. Sometimes actually replying them is tasking because uh, you have that guilt of, you know, trying to reply to tell somebody, no, you don't want to do that without kind of offending them somehow or kind of demoralizing them. But at the same time, if you say yes, you're basically saying yes to something, giving something that you don't have, which doesn't make any sense. So search for, it's good to search for mentors. It's very important. Believe me, mentors played a very important role in my life as an academic and many other people I know, you know. So yeah, search for the mentors, but please be strategic in your search. Search for those that will really add value to where you're going and not just those that just bring name and nothing more. You know, and um, another question here is from um, Afis. What do you say to someone becoming, uh, what do you say to someone coming from a particular field example, biomedical science, but looking forward to a PhD in data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence due to some courses, experience, experiences of the person, experiences the person has gathered in DS and ML? I don't know if that question. Okay, I would yeah, I so a lot of technical terms, yeah, so I- I actually, actually answered that question. Uh, this person, can I please, for the sake of time, direct you to watch that YouTube video, I, a YouTube link. Uh, that was one of the questions I addressed there, you know, because of the way the, the, the world is going, a lot of people want to come into a, a, a computer science related area. So some people would tell me that they've uh, worked in software industry for multiple years. And uh, because of that, although their field is not software, can that end them in master's or PhD? You know, it's a, uh, I would, in North America, let me speak of North America specifically, in, in, uh, in Europe maybe, because I've seen people who, come from different field and do something entirely different in the UK, it's, it seems to be easier there. But here, we actually want to see that if you're coming to have a certificate in core computer science, it is not about knowing how to code. Computer science is not all about coding. There are theories and foundations of computer science you need to know to be able to defend that certificate. So we cannot actually comfortably admit you to computer science and give you a computer science degree that you cannot defend. So we are often insist that you know that foundation of computer science, which is most time taught in your first year, right? That is why, for example, I have a, I have a, a guy joining me from Nigeria or two. Two of them are engineers. They're from electrical, uh, electronics engineer. They have gotten some computer courses during their first, uh, during their first, or first degree. But beyond that, they, they work as full stack software developer. I didn't take them because they are full stack software developer. I, take, I took them because now they did some computer science courses, but I didn't take them directly into computer science. They are coming to do some undergraduate foundational courses first. 
they have to complete that core undergraduate foundational courses first, and then do the uh, required graduate courses before they get the certificate of masters of computer science. So it is not that straightforward. So uh, it, that video addresses so much, including if, if you have worked for a certain number of years and want to come back to the field, is it possible? Some people ask me questions about age. How does your age fare with respect to getting admission? All those things, I, I dealt with it on the video on that YouTube channel. If you go to the channel, do well to uh, subscribe, like it, and also more importantly, comment your questions there. I'm coming up the next time to address those questions because I find it easy to come up there and answer the questions because I don't have time to start addressing them one after the other in an email because of the volume of messages I get on social media and in my email. So that, that's the thing I would say. I wouldn't say that it's not possible, but you might want to, you might have to do some bridging. It depends on the school and what they think you need, but it's, they wouldn't just pick you and admit you because you have got some uh, uh, hand-on experience on it. The hand-on experience does not make you really, really a, a computer scientist. Yeah. Thank you, Rita. So please take time to watch um, Rita's, uh, the video on um, Rita's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, let's quickly take another question. So this one is from Ifrani. Um, he said, um, I'm an assistant uh, lecturer in a Nigerian university with MSc as well as being the best graduating student from my undergrad studies. I currently have published 11 journal articles but didn't write GRE. Um, I've applied for PhD in civil engineering in the US and still applying. Do you think I stand good chance of being admitted with Let's just give him a minute and I'll take that question. Uh, please go ahead, sorry for that. Um... Okay, so I'm gonna take your question, uh, um, uh, Christian, if I I do think that yes, with your... This is interesting. You talked about uh, uh, being a best graduate student, having 11 publications, and applying for admission in the United States. Yes, I think you, you with your record, you, you seem to have a, a good profile in terms of your research. Um, if the publication is on, is on a good venue, hopefully, um, that's a, a good one. And also, if uh, with your being a best graduate student is also a good thing as well. However, it is. I wouldn't tell you it is guaranteed. Remember, uh, I go to that place I talked about. I talked about finding tips. How you sell yourself is very important. How do you write a professor? Getting a professor is very important. It's key to whether you're going to be admitted or not. You're not gonna be admitted to my university for PhD without a professor committing to you. So the first step towards getting, so most of I'll just tell people go and look for a professor. When you get that, it halves your work. Because when I commit, I'm going to supervise it. What happens is that I just look for your application and say, yes, I'm going to work with him. I've interviewed him and everything. So getting that professor is very important. Beyond just publishing, you want to find a professor that aligns with your research and write them a personalized email. One of don't do's when contacting professors is never write a mass email to professors it almost always backfires. If you can't spend one, uh, one minute, five minutes trying to construct personalized email, reflecting my work and stuff like that, why do you think I'm gonna spend one minute reading it? So your ability to read professor's work, tell her your email, show your passion and your vision will actually determine whether you're going to get admission or not. I hope these applications you're doing are based on the fact that you have contacted professors and not random applications. That would be my answer to that. You know, talking about um, personalized letter, it's very important. I, I have seen cases where um, prospective uh, graduate students send me um, a copy of their mass email, and you can tell. I mean, some cases <laughs> it's just so it's just so careless. I mean, I had a particular case where the person was actually saying that. Um, uh, um, uh, that I'm a very that that I'm a very good professor in corporate and commercial law, and this is 
I've never done anything on corporate and commercial law. That's not even the area I work. So it was on the process of going through the letter, I now actually see the person was making reference to some other universities in US, not even in Canada. So that was when I then, oh, this person probably prepared, prepared this mail, then took off the name and then put my name and send it. And when you receive that kind of email, I mean, it's not the kind of email I would waste my time responding to because uh, it doesn't really That's make so any sense. You have to put some That's effort individualized targets, not mass mailing of email. You know, okay. if I notice that that's a mass email, I wouldn't really waste my time with responding to it, like you said. Apart from that, so I have got occasions where someone emailed me and I felt the person is good. And I was like saying, okay, maybe I'm going to just get on an interview and talk to them. Let me just chat, not even interview with the person. And then another professor in the same, my university, also the person had emailed the person at the same time. <laughs> And then the professor said, hey, you, do you happen to know this person? He or she just emailed me asking for a position. Do you think he's good? I was like, oh, he also emailed me. So two of us now said, OK, that basically means he doesn't know what he wants. So apparently, he has missed out on two of us. So you don't play that kind of sharp games, kind of. You probably want to be careful about what you want and be a bit genuine in, in, in your request. Don't just do it whosoever gives me because eventually you're going to get the admission, but you're going to do the work. And that's where the whole thing comes. Like when I applied for my admission, I haven't got a lot. I was very young. I didn't even know what I was doing, to be honest with you. But I was what I know how to do is to be honest and to be genuine to myself. No, nobody reviewed my SOP. I didn't even go to online to go and see, see all these things out. I just wrote from the heart of my heart what I want to be. I said it. My dream is to be a professor of international repute. I'm seeing myself that in the next 10 years, I should be there. Mm -hmm. I wrote it in my SOP. And there, it's not because I want to get admission. It is because that is what I feel. You know, one of the professors still remember my letter of intent to date. It said that kept everybody on their toe. In some of the schools, I got up to eight professors wow. wanting to work with me. I was really kind of natural. I said it exactly what I feel. I wasn't packaging. So at times, that authenticity, it still sells. And you, you, it's easy to figure out. It's easy to be. And most of the things I said I was going to do, I have done all of them. And not even most all, I have done all of them. So I wasn't really talking to get admission. So sometimes, in as much as getting admission is good, but trying to actually get to understand yourself, who you are, the kind of thing that are capable of putting you up at night, working long. Because for me, even when I got admitted, I had prestigious scholarships. I still took time. I told my supervisor, this, uh, this is the kind of research I want to do. That's it, the research that can hold my interest. We talked about it. I took around three months to figure out the research, not because there are no research, but because of the kind of thing I can do, the, the kind of thing that can hold my passion. And I thought all these things through. And that is, I would say that that is contributing to who I am today. And I really do advise everyone, try to figure out who you are. Most people haven't understood who they are. That's the thing. When you understand who you are, actually, when you're writing, you are writing exactly who you are. It will come true. Who you are will come true. Naturally. When I, yeah. When I write my statement, or if you read it, you know that if you, if, if you have known me and read that statement, of purpose, I, I know it's that this is exactly you, Rita. I said, yeah, because <laughs> I wrote exactly who I am. Yeah. And that who you are, is, it, it's that authenticity. It has a way of attracting people, yeah. attracts people. So, but most people actually just mass produce emails they see online. The same email, someone you send, another person says, is it not the same person I've read their email before? Just because all of them are copying from the same source. Yes, yeah. So how are you gonna produce original work if you can't produce original emails? So these are tiny, tiny things, tiny mistakes that people make. Yeah. And another thing I also want to add here, you know, in preparing those emails, please take time, get a computer, type the email, don't be using phone, oh, don't use yeah. phone or iPad. The formatting is going to be so poor. I mean, those, those are just uh, very tiny things that go a long way to tell the person reading the email the kind of person you are.
So get a computer, type a well-formatted email and send it. Don't get a phone and then start typing with the phone or tablet. By the time you send it, the words are lines and then, are scattered and, you know. Before we change one word, and it looks like the video is frozen again. Okay. Is there any other question that? Yes. So, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you now. But thank you. Okay. Um. Okay, I'm reading a question from uh, Abayomi. Abayomi, okay, uh, thanks, Rita. Yeah, I'm studying in South Africa now, and I want to come to, for postdoc in Canada, University of Calgary in particular. Please, what step should I take? Okay, yeah, uh, this. Let me answer this fast, fast. If you're going for postdoc, uh, uh, you you want to go for postdoc. You're doing your PhD. One is. The potential places to go to postdoc are those people you are citing in your papers, those people that you're citing in your thesis, people that are doing the likely kind of thing you're doing. This is what I, I tell people. I'm saying it generally from being someone that hires postdocs. Postdoc, the cost is so high. The cost of hiring a postdoc will hire me three good PhD students. So I will not spend that money on somebody I, I'm not sure is going to be a viable addition to my lab. This is a truth nobody will tell you. It's a lot of money, unless you have your own money. If not, be ready to show your maturity in terms of being not only doing an independent work, but being able to help the professor move their research to the next level by supervising their students. Most times, people that are wanting to go for postdoc do not have that maturity, I'm, especially when they are coming from Africa. They, they, they haven't gotten to the stage of research maturity that someone will want to spend that amount of money and bring you. But what I would say, the best way to go, for, to go about it, especially when you have built your profile, is to start contacting those professors, sending them your CV, talking about your research and how your research have, their research have really helped you in building your own research and how you're thinking about coming to join them to develop yourself more and to contribute to their own work. You, doesn't, you don't have to wait until they advertise a position. You can actually mail them. Most times we have money. We are just looking for the right candidate to hire. So you go about it by contacting the people, telling them what you do, the stage you are, and how your work is related and what you want to, how you want to come and join them. Most importantly, how you're going to contribute to their work. I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much, uh, Rita. So now um, we're kind of um, about rounding um, up uh, off on this um, fire side chart. And there's this question I want to ask you. I decided to save it for the last. Uh, when it comes to award and recognition, I think you probably have a museum of, for that now because there are so many. So the question I want to ask now is, of all these awards and recognition, which of them do you admire most? Or which of them is most prestigious to you and why? You know, I have won many, many awards, just like we said, that are uncountable now. But a lot of, a lot of them, um, almost all of them, have some uniqueness that resonate with me because of the reason it was given. But there are two that really kind of I still remember that to that in a way, not because of the value of their work, but either the time they came or what it meant to me, right? So uh, in one of them is the Venier Scholarship. Yeah. The Venier is actually the most prestigious scholarship a, a student can get, a PhD student can get in Canada. So when I landed Canada in 2017, I declared my interest you know, I got into Canada and I saw someone being announced as winning that scholarship, but I told the, the person that was housing me then that I'm going to win it by next year. So I know I just talk it, it somehow, they get laughed. So what is important there that in the, in, in, the, in the next few months, I said I was going for that, I was going to go in for that scholarship. 
the truth is the process of applying for it is insanely tedious. At that young age, it was insane. I didn't even know what I was doing. To put on a very competitive application was challenging for me, but I already said I was gonna win it, so I'm gonna see it through. The process of applying for Vanya scholarship, because it's one of the few things uh, I did when I, I just landed Canada, was so revealing, prepared me for who I am today. Because I had to learn a lot. I had to learn a lot about writing. I'm a mathematical inclined person, I don't like writing. So I had to learn a lot doing that. So that learning process made that scholarship stand out. Apart from preparing the packages that I needed for that scholarship, at the point I came to that, I didn't even have a publication. And not that I don't have a public, I didn't even know how to start writing one. But with help, and because I've said I was gonna to go to Vanya, go for Vanya scholarship, within that first year of preparing for Vanya, I got five papers accepted. So it was a marathon preparation. It was a very stiff learning curve for me. And that prepared me for who I am and the subsequent awards I won because I endured a lot to get everything come together for that award and to get on winning it to be among the top five in the whole nation. It wasn't an easy fit and the only person in the university. So because of the timing that it happened and how I had to push myself and the learning associated with doing it, and how it has prepared me for who I am today. I appreciate that scholarship a lot. It stood out a lot for me. And because of also the doubts that came with, a lot of people do not believe I can do it. Because I was super new and nobody knew who is who, right? So because of that kind of a, a thing surrounding the winning of it and how I think it's contributed to my growth today, I appreciate it a lot. It stood out for me. The second one is in 2007, I was actually, really uh, celebrated in my uh, town. The whole people came together and gave me an award, celebrated me in a very massive way, having governor represented and everything, everything getting closed for my sake. That was really epic for me, it stood out, you know? And when you're doing everything internationally and if you're not recognized by your people, yeah. assist myself as the little O'Willy hot girl <laughs> of yesterday. So that recognition and the, having my people come together, recognize me, give, give me a title and all this thing for what I've been doing actually is memorable for me. And so I appreciate these two a lot, uh, not because they are bigger than every other award I've won, but because they represent different things and they come at a different time in my life that things make uh, different meanings for me. Yeah, Rita. So I think you are the, some of the few prophets that are recognized in their hometown, which is very, which is- yeah, I'm, I'm very much recognized in my town. And I, mean, I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't really believe that, you know, coming out here doesn't, I, I so much appreciate where I come from. I do not think I was gonna be who I am without those, uh, without my community, without those struggles that I passed through without that community norms that people have to imbibe with that actually eventually indirectly builds you up for bigger things without you knowing it, right? Yeah. People, for example, when I tell people, it's not like I'm not a fan of, uh, it's not like I'm a religious fanatic or stuff like that. But when people ask me like, how I, I, I go around in the world presenting, I mean, I can't imagine how many presentations and how many media appearances I've made, right? They probably be heading in the level of 200, 500 and stuff like that. So when I think of how did this thing start, you know, me talking in the public actually started in the church. That is where I learned how to talk in the public. It's not something I was taught in school. Yeah. So when you see all those little things that didn't count, eventually you get different, different skills that eventually help you in life. So I appreciate those village things, no matter how odd they look. If I were to go back, I'm not gonna change a thing yeah. about my childhood, not one. I would really be thinking because remove one thing, I wouldn't be who I am today. You know, Rita, I have no doubt that your experience has indeed um, motivated and will continue to motivate um, a lot of students from Africa and diaspora who are, you know, struggling to um, excel in their field. And um, that was where, of course, we 
took it upon ourselves in ASI Canada to get you to share this experience with the audience. Um, this uh, presentation is being recorded for those uh, who are registered but who are not able to attend it because of time difference or technical reasons. We're going to be uploading it on you, our YouTube channel for them to review later. And um, so please take time. I believe uh, Mariam has posted our YouTube, I mean, our social media handle on the chat box, our Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And um, Mariam, if you could also post the YouTube uh, handle too, that would be good. Uh, ARSI Canada, like I stated at the beginning, is a Canadian not for profit charity organization that aims to you know, attract bright future scholars of African descent to pursue graduate education in Canada. And we do this in a lot of ways by disseminating information from our social media handles, as well as also webinars like this, Meet the Prof, as well as our Study in Canada um, webinar. So please connect with us on social media. We'll have more of these coming up in the future, as well as even our Graduate Study in Canada webinar, which deals with graduate uh, um, application funding, and we we'll also have um, immigration lawyers in Canada that works with us as part of our seminar to provide information to successful applicants to guide them through the visa uh, uh, application process, which is, of course, the most difficult process in your struggle to come to Canada to achieve your dream of Canadian education and also to have the opportunity of being a great scholar and also likely one of the top 100 most powerful men or women in Canada like Rifa. Professor Oji, um, I thank you very much for taking time off your busy schedule to, you know, to join us in this fire chat webinar too. And I'm sure the participants also have uh, benefited immensely from your experience. Please continue to uh, do us proud. We are very proud of you. We've made that very clear. And um, that is where we are going to come to at the end of our fireside chat today. So please stay in touch through our social media to know our next upcoming event. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, have a good day or good evening, depending on what part of the world you are located. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Okay.